Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Chris Quinn. I'm the youth pastor here at Portland Community Church, and I have the privilege to be preaching for you today. And we're going to be looking at Galatians chapter 4, verses 1 through 16. And if you do not have a Bible, you're a guest with us this morning, I invite you to grab a brown hardcover Bible that's in the seat in front of you, and that'll be on page 1170. So we would love for you to go ahead and turn there. And so... We're going to be talking about this idea of adoption and how we are redeemed through this theological concept of adoption. So I want to start with this story that I I saw uh, in a video. And the video is is kind of too long to to show you, but it's it's an amazing video of, of this young girl. She's 19 years old. Her name is Meredith. And Meredith had grown up with a single mother And her mother passed away when she was six years old. And so she was then being raised by her grandparents. Okay, and Meredith struggled. She had a hard life. And she grew up, she became, when she became 19 years old, she started making some bad life choices the way that she put it. And she started living with some friends and just was leading her down a path that was not the way that she wanted to go. So this family called the Dennises took her in. They took her in at 19 years old and after a few months, they decided in this video to reveal to her that they wanted to adopt her. And I didn't know that you can adopt adults. That's actually a legal thing you can do. Uh, And so they adopted this young girl into her family. I think the crazy thing about this when you look at the picture, that little girl that um, the mother is holding, like she looks, she's biological of them. She looks exactly like Meredith, doesn't she? Oh my goodness, like it was meant to be. And they are only nine years older than Meredith. But there was this girl who was unwanted, unloved, who was steeped into life choices that she did not want to go into. And when she experienced that love and that grace and that compassion from this family, this is a Christian family, she broke down. In the video, you'll see her, she, she just cries. She cries her eyes out because she is finally a part of a family. Isn't that amazing? I don't think there's anything in the Bible that, or anything in life that more describes what the gospel is all about in our current world than the idea of adoption. That we, every single one of us, were unwanted, unloved, except by God. And he went so far to show that he wanted us and loved us that he died on the cross for our sins and brought us into his family. And so we've, learned, we've been talking through Galatians about what the gospel really is, what it's, what it's not. And you know, we, we hear about what th- th- this idea of adoption, we think of this cultural thing, and we start to wonder, you know, I want to see a kind of life change in my life where I am no longer the person I was before. That's what adoption is all about. It's about this idea of becoming a child of God. But a child of God acts in a particular way. A child of God does not do certain things. And we talked about in the book of 1 John in a series a while back called The Real Thing, that a child of God, a person who is a Christian, acts as if they are a Christian, acts in a certain way, obeys the, the word of Christ. And so... Many of us, if we're honest, know that we struggle with this. We struggle with trying to, to, trying to obey, trying to live by the way that God has created us to live. And so we know that there is something that needs to change. We know that we, if we have these sins, we have these addictions, these, these attitudes, these desires that we've been fighting with our whole life. And we wonder, when am I ever going to change? When, is, is, when am I going to start really acting like the Christian that God has called me to be. And so today, we're going to look at four acts of redemption when God adopts us into his family. So four acts of God, how he, reveal, how he adopts us and how he redeems us as the people he has called us to be. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to start uh, chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. I invite you to look at it and, and we'll read this. What I am saying is that as long as an heir is underage, he is no different from a slave. Although he owns the whole estate, the heir is subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. So also, when we were underage, 
We were in slavery under the elemental spiritual forces of the world. And so Paul is continuing this argument. Last week, we talked about the fact that this group called the Judaizers, who we've been talking a lot about over, the, over this whole series, this group of people who are trying to add on law onto the gospel that you need to do these certain things in order to be a true Christian following the Jewish law. Uh, Paul is continuing this argument saying, first of all, the promise of Abraham, the Abrahamic covenant, is more important because it's based on faith. And that's what this whole thing has been about from the beginning. So Paul is continuing this argument. When he says something like, what I am saying is, you got to go back to what he's been talking about. Uh, and so he, when we look back, he's been talking about how we are, just verses 26 through 29 of chapter 3, that we are now adopted, we are now children of God. Because we belong to Christ, we are part of that family. We are part of the promise of God. And so he's making sure that, he, he, that we understand this concept of how this adoption has happened, this redemption has happened. And so he uses this analogy to talk about an heir and a slave, a son and a slave. And he compares this idea that a son, when they are underage, they are waiting for their inheritance to come. They are waiting for their rightful place uh, to take over their father's estate. Um, but when they are underage, they are almost like a slave because they don't, they, the inheritance hasn't been carried out yet. For a slave, and we've got to understand it in a Middle Eastern culture back in that day kind of slavery, not the American uh, human trafficking kind of slavery, but this was like a slavery as in people who were in financial trouble, um, legal trouble in some way, and so were put into slavery, um, into some sort of job where they were owned by a family and they were servants of the house. Okay? This is, it's a very different thing. It's not like these human trafficking things that we have heard about um, through our American understanding of slavery. But still, at the same time, these people did not have any ownership. They did not have any part of the family. They were not, they did not share in that inheritance. They were not promised that someday when, you know, the, their owner passes away that their, that all his stuff would pass on to them. They had no rights. And so what he's saying is he's making this comparison to help us understand that before this, before the faith of Christ um, was inaugurated, this whole that, that Jesus came and made the promise evident that this is what God has been promising all along, this Messiah who would die on the cross for our sins. As long as we were waiting for that, we were like a slave waiting we were, we, and, and wondering if we were going to be a part of this whole story. But really, we were sons. We were, going to, we were going to participate in this. And he says this very interesting phrase. So also when we were underage, we were in slavery under the elemental spiritual forces of the world. And so he's saying when we were, before we came to know Christ, we were in slavery to this concept of the elemental things of the world. Uh, if you have an NIV, you're going to, and that's what we're using up here, that word spiritual, I hate to break it to you, is not in the Greek. It's not in the original language that Paul wrote. He did not write the word spiritual. That is a interpretation by the people who translated the NIV. Really what that word elemental things of the world, the concept is more of like the things, the building blocks that make up the world. It's kind of like earth, wind, fire, those kinds of things that make up the world. And so what we're looking at is these are anything, physical things that we could put in the place of God that we would say, this is our God that we worship. Much of what ancient times worship were like these physical idols where they would build it out of wood, stone, um, mud, clay, whatever they wanted to make it out of, they would make these idols and they would worship it, okay? And anything that we place in front of God is an idol. And our idols are a lot more subtle, the things that we would worship. For us, it could be, it's, it's things like your job, the, su the success of your children, okay? How well your favorite sports team does, I know for me that used to be a huge problem. And so you have this idea that anything that you put in front of God 
anything, a friendship, relationship, job, the success of your business, anything that you place in front of God, that's a thing that you are worshiping and that's a thing that you are putting your life onto. And he says, and when you worship an idol like that, you are bound to it, that you are in slavery to it. And this could include what I think Paul is mostly talking about, though, is he's talking about the idea of the law. That if you were to decide to be like the Judaizers and trust in your salvation because you follow the law, that you are now enslaved to it. We talked about it last week, that the law, the purpose of it was to be a revealer of sin. And so what there, there's, because of the fact that we are sinful people, we are broken, and we are born with this sinful nature that none of us can possibly look at the law and be able to find anywhere where we are the exception to the rule that we can act out perfectly. And so Paul is reminding us of this, that when you are, when you put yourself under the law, you are enslaved to it because you're going to constantly be looking how you can be doing it perfectly, but it's just impossible. And it's a never-ending cycle. And so he's telling us that this is, this is our condition. This is the way that we were. And the point that Paul, Paul here is making is that he's building on this idea that it is only through Christ that we can possibly be free. And so the first act of God is that God knew our need for redemption. God sees this that we were in slavery and he knew it. And the beautiful thing about when you see, it says that God knows something, he saw what people were struggling with. God, what God knows, God acts upon. So an example is when in the book of Exodus, you see at the beginning that the people are under slavery. It says that God remembered his covenant and, that he dis- and so then he decided to act. It was time and he did and he acted on behalf of Israel to free them from their slavery. So when God knows our need, God provides a way for it to come out. And that's the whole idea. That's the beginning point of redemption is that God knows it. God is not surprised by it. You know, we don't believe in a faith that somehow God is surprised at the fact that we are sinners and that we mess up and that we make mistakes. God isn't ever shocked at the things that we do because he knows the way that we are. And yet, even though he knows every single one of those things, he still came and died for us on the cross. That's the beauty of what this gospel is all about. Every single one of your sins, because of, the, of where we are in the chronology of history, every single one of your sins was in the future when D- Jesus died on the cross. So he knew, every single one of them, he knew that it was gonna be that way, and he came and died for us anyway. Isn't that an amazing message? Isn't that amazing? Praise God for that. Okay, let's look at verses four through seven. And I'll just warn you, this is a heavy theological set of verses. So I want to make sure to be very clear on these. Um, So strap in. Um, I got got to let you know, I'm actually a a, a nerd when it comes to theology. Like I could just sit and read theological books, like the most boring of the boring kind of stuff. I can't help it. I just love it. So bear with me. I'm going to Reader's Digest it as best as I possibly can. But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our heart, our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. Paul uses this incredible device in his writings many times. That first word in verse four, but. Paul loves to deliver the bad news. And so the bad news is in verses one through three, where he says that you were, we were in slavery to our idols, the law, this, you know, these, these things in our world that we would worship. We were in slavery to those things, but. And then this is where he delivers the good news. When the set time had fully come, meaning when it was time for Christ, when it was time for God to act, when he said, okay, now's the time I'm going to act, God sent his son. Now we could skip over that phrase and obviously at face value, it's an amazing phrase, God sent his son. But then he says, born of a woman, born under the law. And we have to understand what Paul is 
telling us about. He's giving us this, these theological concepts that we must believe and must understand in order to understand fully what the gospel is. And what he's describing is this idea of what we would call the hypostatic union, okay? Big fancy word, okay, or concept. What the hypostatic union means is God's unity, the union of his full divinity and full humanity. Now, that should make our brains hurt because we would, and another way to put that is God is, that Jesus was 100% God, 100% man. I can do math, 200% is, that's not how it works, okay? But the reason this is so important for us to understand is because the gospel is based solely upon it. If you say that Jesus was fully human instead of fully God, well, the gospel doesn't work because then Jesus is just like every single one of us, okay? And if he's like every single one of us, then he can't die on the cross for our sins because Jesus needed to be perfect. Jesus needed to be the ultimate perfect sacrifice who lived a perfect life. If he was 100% human like every single one of us, he would have been born with that sinful nature and would not have been able to be the sacrifice that he needed to be. Also, if he was 100% God, then all he is is spirit. He's not physical. He doesn't take on our, 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 our broken frames. He doesn't take on um, and isn't able to sympathize with our weaknesses, as Hebrews says. And as well, physically, if, if he didn't take on a human form in some way, then he can't die on the cross because he's just spirit. So it's really important that we understand this. There have been and I just took a class in church history. Um, I'm in seminary, and they, this is something that was argued over, I mean, ad nauseum. It's still argued about today, about how you reconcile the ideas. But it's really important that we understand that. And then to say that he's born under the law reminds us that Jesus was born under this idea that he was submitted to the law, submitted like we are born into this sinful frame and needed to, to obey God fully. That he was, he was subject to the law as well, and he followed it. The, word, the way that he says it in, in Matthew is that he came to fulfill the law, not to abolish it, and he did. It's exactly what he did. And the reason he did all this, as he says, is to redeem those under the law. The beautiful thing about this concept of redemption, we've sung this song before, it's called um, I Am Redeemed. It's one of my favorite songs. It's one of those songs that every time I hear it, like emotions start going and I love it. Um, where God just starts working on my heart, reminding me of what he has done. To be redeemed is, to, is this concept of being made new, taken from old and brought in to new. It's this idea of making a payment in order to deliver to bring deliverance for a person. And so the idea of redemption is that God is bringing us out of this bondage to the law, bondage to sin, bondage to the things of the world. And he is break, breaking us out of that bondage, of that slavery, and bringing us into a relationship with him, making all things new, restoring things to be to the way that he created things to be. We've got to understand this, that the whole point of the gospel is this idea of redemption. It's not just accept Jesus into your heart and go to heaven when you die. Those are valid statements, but it's incomplete, very incomplete gospel. Because the gospel is all about this idea of redeeming us, of bringing us back to the place that we were created to be in, to be in perfect relationship with God, and that we get a taste of that here in this life, but full redemption comes someday when we go to heaven and see God face to face. Un in, without our broken bodies, without our sinful natures, those things are removed and God makes all things new. That is the hope that we have. But he says that we might receive adoption to sonship. And this is where it gets even more amazing. Because when, God, when adoption happens, I don't know if any of you have gone through the process of adoption before, but once you adopt a child into your family, that child is yours forever. And that's the way that God works. When he adopts you in, you're in forever. You are in his family no matter what. 
Paul says in Romans chapter 8 that there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God. Nothing. No amount of sin, no amount of brokenness, no amount of mistakes that you make can separate you from the love of God. That once you give your life to Christ, once you make that commitment, it is sure, it is unbroken forever. And then he says this idea to sonship. This, and we've got to understand this. And this works for all of us, men and women alike, which is why I think he doesn't say the word daughtership. I don't even know if that's a word. But where he's, he's basically saying each and every one of us are an equal share into the inheritance of God, that we can partake in the kingdom of God, that we are all a part of this story to be redeemed by God. And so he says, because you are his sons, because you are now able to take in this inheritance, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out Abba, Father, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit comes in as a counselor, as a comforter, as the convictor of sin, as the one who reminds us who God is. He's the healer. And he comes in in the Spirit who calls out Abba, Father. And Abba is this amazing Aramaic term that Jesus used uh, that basically, basically translates to daddy, like a familiar term for dad. Like, I cannot wait for my daughter someday to call me daddy. You know, she's still, she's two months, so she can't quite. The most she can do right now, she's starting to do this. So she goes, oh, that's what she does. It's adorable. Uh, and so, but it's this familiar term that you are entered into this family, that you are a part of God, and you get to partake in his story, in his story of redemption. And I, I would be remiss not to say something. The part of the story of the redemption is not just for us to selfishly take in and say, thank you, Jesus. That, that's a good part of it. We get to enjoy that. But to go out, and we are part of the mission now to go out and find as many people as we can and bring them in here so that they come to know Christ. It is so important for us to remember that. And so God's second act of redemption is that God rescued us from our slavery to sin. That God is on this rescue mission, that he did not leave us there. He did not, he knew that we were there and he didn't leave us there to figure it out. That he decided that he was going to do this. And he decided this from the moment that Adam and Eve had fallen. This was, this was in his plan. This was from the beginning. He knew exactly what was going to happen and he was ready. He was ready for it and this is what he wanted to do. And so God rescued us from our slavery to sin. And so because you have that Holy Spirit, if you have given your life to Christ, the Holy Spirit is in your hearts. And because you have that Holy Spirit, he is the one that can give you assurance that you are adopted into God's family that you, and convicts you of sin, which is a loving act telling you that you have done wrong and you need to, to do better, to, to, to admit your sin, and, but the power to move past it and hope for the future. That even though things are tough right now, that there is hope. That this isn't all that there is to life. That God has a greater hope and purpose for our lives. And so we look at the next section, next paragraph. Let's look at verses 8 through 11. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were slave to those who by nature are not gods. But now that you know God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you are turning back to those weak and miserable forces? Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? You are observing special days and months and seasons and years. I fear for you that somehow I have wasted my efforts on you. And this is where Paul is being pretty blunt and calling them out for the way that they're acting because the Galatians had allowed for these Judaizers to come in and change the way that they thought about the gospel. You know, adding this law, adding this idea, he's, this is not the way that you are supposed to be. This is not what you, what you were created to do. So he's saying, when you did not know God, you were slaves to those by nature who are not God. So to those idols, to those things in our lives, the, the law that we would think we could make ourselves right before God. He says, but now that you know God, now that you know this story, now that this is true, now that you have heard about this and actually that you are known by God, how is it that you're going back? How is it, he, this is the question he's asking, how is it that you have gone back to this way? 
You knew God. You heard the real story. You came to know him. That spirit came in, the Holy Spirit came into your life, assured you of who you are and how, what you were created to do. And now you're going back to this old system of law and ritual? Do you think that's actually going to work? And what he's reminding them of is this idea of what truly happens when we are converted. We hear this phrase, conversion, and I think sometimes we get confused. Because again, when I was a kid, I prayed the sinner's prayer. I was five years old to uh, give my life to Christ. And actually, the thing is, is it was my brother who led me to Christ. My brother who now is not following Christ. He's the one, five years old, led me to Christ and prayed some form of sinner's prayer, but there was no assurance. There wasn't this belief in me. I was constantly afraid. I was constantly fearful of whether I was actually saved or not. And it wasn't until I was 15 years old when I broke down and just said, okay, God, I'm giving my life to you. Conversion is this idea that there is this obvious life change that happens. I heard a story of a man this week named David Wood. And the best way to put it is that this man was a sociopath. That he was put in prison for nearly beating his father to death just because he felt like it. He just felt like it. He just wanted to. And while he was in prison, he started contemplating what he was going to do afterwards. He probably, he probably had antisocial personality disorder and narcissistic personality disorder, the way he described himself, which usually is a recipe for a serial killer, okay? Terrifying man. And he was making plans of what he was going to do. At, you know, he, I think he wanted to become a serial killer when he came out of prison. But then he met this man in his cell, his cellmate named Randy, who was a Christian. And over time, this is the major Reader's Digest version, David gave his life to Christ, a person that you would think was impossible, that there's no way this guy is ever going to give his life to Christ, and he did. And David says that immediately he felt a change and did not want to do those things anymore. This miraculous change that happened in his life was sudden. And that's what conversion is all about. Conversion is this idea that is the, this change in your life, change of the way that you think, change in the way that you want to live your life. It's not just... Um, believe intellectually believing a different idea than you did before it's a whole set of life change and for many of us and I know this is hard to hear a story like David we start thinking man I want to be I want to have that happen to me I still got things in my life that I don't want to do anymore but I still feel it I don't I don't want I want it to change like that and that's my story my story is that God is has had to be patient and working on me slowly and slowly because I'm pretty stubborn. But here's the thing is that God isn't giving up. God isn't, God hasn't let you go. And the whole point of the, of the spirit coming, and this is his third act, is that God gave us his spirit to change our sinful hearts. The whole point of the spirit to come into your life, the Holy Spirit coming into your heart is to change you. It's to make you new, to redeem you, to bring, to bring you back to the way that you were intended to live. That's the whole point of this. And so in order to inherit the kingdom of God and all that God is, that you have to be changed. You can't come in the way that, that you are. Yes, God invites us in as we are to learn the story to hear. But in order to enter into a full relationship with him, we have to be changed. But that's a work that he does. And that's the whole point of this Galatians is that you can't do that work. You can't make yourself right before God. It's got to be an act that he does and he does it. And this is the vehicle which he does it, is that God gives us his spirit, gives us himself into our hearts to change us into the people he's created us to be. In this last section, I'll go over very briefly. He says, I plead with you, brothers and sisters, become like me for I became like you. You did me no wrong, as you know. It was because of an illness that I preached the gospel to you. And even though my illness was a trial to you, you did not treat me with contempt or scorn. Instead, you welcomed me as if I were an angel of God, as if I were Christ Jesus himself. Where then is your blessing of me now? I can testify that if you could have done so, you would have torn out your eyes and given them to me. Have I now become your enemy by telling you the truth? Paul is pleading with them. He's saying, become like 
become like me as I became like you. It's this pleading for what we would call repentance. And repentance is this call to, to make a choice, to make a life change, to say I, and, and confess that, yes, what I have done is sin, that you no longer blame anybody else. You don't blame your health. You don't blame you know, other people for your sin. You don't blame your financial situation, your mood, your job, boredom, fatigue, health situation. You admit that it was your choice and yours alone to sin. And you, and you confess it and you say, God, that was me. But then you say, and I say that that's sin and I want to follow you. I want to follow after your word. But true repentance leads to that life change. But here's the beauty of God's grace is that repentance is always available. And that's the fourth act, that God made repentance perpetually available. No matter how many times you fall, no matter how many times you sin, how many times you make a mistake, no matter how many times you break that um, covenant with God and sin, the offer of repentance stands. It is always there. You are never too far gone in your relationship with God that he won't invite you back. And as well, what this means is if you are not a Christian in this place this morning, that there is, no, there is no height, depth, or anything, how far you could be away from God that he won't bring you into his family. Because he's God. He's the creator of the universe. He put all of this in motion. And because he lived that perfect life and, and died on the cross for our sins, he is able to cover over every sin. Doesn't matter what, whatever it is you did. And so this offer of grace is always available. You are never too far gone. So I want to close with this reminder that the goal of Christianity, yes, is to remember that we have been invited into this story of redemption, that, that God has changed us, that God has made us new, that he has redeemed us from our sinful nature. But that the point of Christianity now, once you have made that decision, is that you go out and you share this message with as many people as you possibly can. I think it's time for us as Christians to, instead of complaining on Facebook or social media about how messed up our world is, but instead to go out into the world and start making a difference by living as Christ has called us to live. That we go out and we say, I will go feed the hungry and the poor. I will go uh, free the people caught in human trafficking, encourage those who are in addiction, feeding, clothing the poor, comforting those who are grieving, protecting those in abusive relationships. But most of all, we need to make sure that this place, Sunday mornings, is a safe haven for every single person who walks through those doors, knowing that they can come in here and they can find refuge, love, salvation, comfort, and grace. That is what we are here to do. That is why we come here on Sunday mornings. Let's pray. God, we just thank you so much for your love and your grace for us. It is beyond understanding, beyond what we even deserve. God, we just desire to give our lives to you, to follow you, and to know that you are with us. And God, that, that our adoption to you is certain. That we have, be, we have become your sons and your daughters, and we have equal share in who you are. And so, God, we just thank you for this, and we pray this in your name. Amen.